Welcome to The Confidence Interval, talking science, people and population health. We explore the research happening at the MRC Epidemiology Unit, University of Cambridge, and meet some of our researchers to find out what makes them tick. I'm Pam Mungru, the Digital Communications Manager for the unit. New research from the Universities of Cambridge and Bristol has found that adolescents consume around two thirds of their daily calories from ultra processed foods. To learn more about the research, I met with the study's first author, Dr. Janaina Chavez Ugaldi from the MRC Epidemiology Unit. Before I found out about her research, I asked her what are ultra processed foods. So the definition came from Brazil, from a group of researchers, uh, from the group of Carlos Monteiro. And they were trying to understand the nutrition transition in Brazil and why is this trend of increased obesity and chronic diseases. So they went down to the kitchens and tried to understand what was in the cupboards of people. And it, it ended up being that people that had salt, sugar in their cupboards were healthier so what that meant in some shape or form is that they were cooking from scratch. So a new framework or categorization system emerged in that they try to classify foods into four groups. So this is the NOVA classification food system. NOVA is not an acronym. It's just, I think Carlos Monteiro tried to show that we should see the food system in a different light, like a supernova. So the NOVA framework has four categories of foods. NOVA one is unprocessed or minimally processed foods, basically how you find them in nature. You can take out inedible parts or take out microbes that might harm human health. So pasteurized milk is minimally processed or unprocessed. Nuts, seeds, uh, some cereals uh, like oats. Then we have group number two, which is culinary processed ingredients. So you take something from nature, process it to a certain extent in order to cook with them. For example, butter, vinegar, salt, honey, sugar. So that's culinary ingredients, Nova two. Then we have Nova three, processed foods. So you have group number one and you process it to a little bit of a higher extent. You can can food and that's processed. You can cook them and add some culinary ingredients from group two. You can ferment them and make bread, beer, wine, cheese, processed foods, processed meats, sorry, canned tuna. So that's processed food, fantastic. The thing is that we have a NOVA 4, and that's ultra processing, and that comes in the name. So it's basically, instead of, I, I'd like to call them ultra processed products rather than foods. Um, there's very little or whole foods remaining. Uh, you take the minimally processed food and process it to an extent that you lost all the goodness in it. There are industrial formulations with a lot of chemicals and with a lot of additives. And the thing is that it's not only about the ingredients, but they're also very convenient, usually cheaper and more attractive than their less processed counterparts. You can usually eat them on the go. They're highly profitable, they're highly marketed, and they provide a solution for many reasons because you chuck in in the microwave and it's done. Uh, or you take it out of the freezer and put it in, a, in, a, in the oven and it's done. So that's kind of the, the framework that research is trying to classify foods to understand the effect of ultra processed food on health. I must say there are other classification systems to capture the level of processing, but the NOVA has been recognized by the WHO as a reliable uh, system to monitor diets around the world. It has its faults and we can discuss them, but um, that's how, that's the classification system we used in our study. So your paper, Ultra Processed Foods and Their Impact on Adolescent Health in the UK has been published. First off, what is the premise of the paper? What have you found out in that research? First of all, I wanted to quantify the scale of the consumption, the scale of the problem, let's call it. So the premise was, first of all, how much are teenagers consuming? That's the first thing we wanted to find out. And within the paper, also to see if there were any 
characteristics that were associated with a higher consumption and to see if there were any changes through, through the measurements of the years of the survey. We found, as I said, that um, 66% of the calories on average from 2008 to 2019, the average consumption of UPFs in teenagers between the age of 11 and 18 comes from ultra processed food sources in terms of calories. And in terms of weight, it's about 43%. So and, and roughly half, half a, like 900 grams per day of ultra processed food sources. And we included the measure of grams because there are some ultra processed foods that calories do not capture the level of processing. For example, non-nutritive sweeteners do not contribute to calories, but contribute to volume of consumption. So that's why we included that measure. And we also found socioeconomic uh, inequalities and demographic uh, patterning of consumption. For example, uh, we found that region was associated with a higher consumption. Uh, we also found that teenagers that identified being from a white ethnicity consumed way more ultra processed food than their non-white counterparts. And, and, and this raises a big question to me. Is there a protective effect of being non-white in terms of, is there a bit of a different food culture, a different traditional foods, minimally processed, a different family dynamic, family culture, um, social networks, social access, because it's usually the non-white groups that are suffering the highest inequalities. But in this case, those are the ones that consume less ultra processed foods. So it just raised a lot of questions in my head. Uh, so as I said, this, the premise of this was let, let's measure consumption. Let's measure what's happening across different groups, across different years. And we did find a decrease in consumption through the years between 2008 and 2019. However, consumption on average, it's still two thirds. These measures are pre pandemic levels. So the headline could have been there's a decrease in consumption, whereas Although we saw a decline, the, the less consumption that we saw through the, year, through the years was 63%, which is still humongous, right? So let's not miss the point of the level of consumption. It is problematic. We need to see what happens post-pandemic -pan measures. The, the survey will be released later in the year, and hopefully we can carry out some, some follow-up of this study. What was it then that led you to further investigate UPF's uh, dietary requirements, dietary issues, socioeconomic issues? My, my career has been a long one. I am a food engineer. Uh, I trained, I'm, I'm a Mexican food engineer, so I worked in a very big factory refining oil for a very big company. Uh, there was a lot of power dynamics and I understood that the food system was very unequal. And that led me to change careers because I was asking this food company, so what, what are we doing? I'm seeing a nutrition transition from traditional foods into packaged foods in Mexico. What's happening here? And this food company, the response was always, we are feeding the world, but never thinking about what's the consequence of those foods that we're feeding the world. And as an example, one of the things that we did in the factory was hydrogenizing oil or refining palm oil to, to make it one of the highest used ingredients in the ultra processed food industry. However, I changed careers into public health. I came to the UK in 2014 and started a career, as I said, in, in public health. And in my PhD, I had uh, one of the studies was talking to teenagers and asking them about their eating behaviors. What leads you to eat whatever unhealthy foods, quote unquote. And there were a lot of characteristics of what they described as unhealthy that ticked into the categorization of ultra processed food, usually higher in fat, sugar and salt, nutritionally unbalanced, highly marketed, very convenient, on the go. So it wasn't only on the level of ingredients. It was also about this broader 
luring into brand loyalty and eat me, eat me, eat me, but we don't really know what's in you beyond the nutritional facts. And that, I continued trying to pursue that thread of ultra processing. And in, in this role as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge, I am using the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, uh, where we classified all the foods in the UK Nutrient Data Bank into foods that were ultra processed and not ultra processed, and tried to quantify what is the amount that teenagers between the age of 11 to 18 are consuming in this country. Um, and we found out that it's a starking 66% of their calories is coming from these sources. So that raised a lot of, of questions because we know that adults in the UK are consuming 57 approximately of their calories. But then we have a 10, 9% increase in teenagers. How is this generation of teenagers going to look 20 years ahead? How is the healthcare system going to look 20, 30 years ahead? What's the quality of life that these people are going to have? What's the quality of policymakers we're going to have when they're older? So that's kind of been, has been a thread of research I've been pursuing for a while now. And I'm, I'm deeply passionate about it because it highlights the inequalities. With this paper, with this research, with the findings and with the concern of long-term impact of UPFs, how do you hope to influence policy? So we have a, a follow-up study from this. A brilliant master student, uh, Rebecca Brody, tried to dive deeper into the socioeconomic inequalities in, in all of this and tried to see subgroups. So which types of ultra-processed food are being consumed to what extent I am, and, and by whom? So no surprise, all teenagers are consuming too much ultra-processed food. The thing is that higher socioeconomic groups are consuming a little bit less on average, but foods that are usually more expensive and marketed as healthier. Sweetened yogurts, breakfast cereals, meat replacements, whereas the lower socioeconomic groups are consuming more of what we know are junk foods and a bit cheaper. So trying to find those socioeconomic patterning within subgroups of these foods, we start to see within the inequalities to see if we can target policies as a stage-wise approach or target different socioeconomic groups. That was a first, again, very descriptive, but is giving us more information of the patterning of, of consumption. And another follow-up study, we're trying to see, and it's a big question that has been raised in Parliament, how much of the foods that are classified as ultra-processed are also high in fat, sugar, and salt? So we're running that study at the moment, and the premise of that one is, can we modify the current nutrient profile model that is guiding the policy on foods that are high in fat, sugar, and salt to include some foods that are only ultra processed food, but fit into the category of some subgroups like sugar sweetened beverages that don't fall into the taxation system, can we include those foods and to make a nutrient profile model that also captures a certain level of ultra processing? So that that's kind of the the long winded answer to say it's been a stepwise approach to understand the problem in the UK to a higher extent and try to see what policies are already there. We're trying not to reinvent the wheel, but what can we use that is there that can be extended to capture a level of processing that evidence is suggesting that has an impact on health. Before we talk about the inequalities in the food systems, what are the potential issues around such a high consumption of UPFs? There's a lot of debate and huge question marks about the mechanisms. What is really happening in ultra? Is it the level of processing? Is it the ingredients? So a lot of research is focusing on some of the ingredients. For example, non-nutritive sweeteners, emulsifiers, hydrogenated oils. Well, now in the food system in the UK, hydrogenated oils shouldn't, shouldn't be used. But an example of a partially hydrogenated oil is margarine. 
So what's the effect of that on health? Emerging research is suggesting that emulsifiers have a lot of effects at the level of the gut and create leaky guts. And that has an array of effects at mental health level because of the gut-brain axis. Depression, anxiety, lack of sleep. Leaving that aside, of the, this is kind of an organ part of the thing. When we talk about long-term health, we are seeing that ultra-processed food displaces minimally processed food. And minimally processed food has a lot of nutrients and ingredients arranged in a 3D way in space that hold the magic in them if we see food as medicine. So let's break down this thing about the matrix of food and the 3D dimension. We have corn on the cob, that's minimally processed. Then we have canned corn, all good, lasts longer on the shelf, fantastic. And then we have Doritos. It's a corn-based snack, but there's very little of the initial corn on the cob that you had and the nutrients and the water and the fiber and the fats that it had are basically removed in that ultra processing, putting aside all the additives and ingredients it has. Then that's that's the food matrix um, theory that ultra processed food loses the food matrix um, and it affects the rate at what we at which we eat it so we eat faster ergo we're having more calories ingested per second um, another theory about the non-nutritive sweeteners and this has to do more with uh, nutritional epidemiology Nutri- uh, non-nutritive sweeteners um, do not register in the brain as you're being satiated and there's something that you're ingesting alongside that it's also liquid and the brain takes a bit longer to clock that um so we tend up to to compensate we eat the diet we drink the diet coke but we end up compensating in terms of calories with other foods but we're tricking the brain that it was a diet coke i had barely nothing but alongside the non-nutritive sweeteners dietary beverages also have other ingredients, uh, sometimes caffeine, sometimes emulsifiers. So another theory, uh, and actually the the only randomized control trial, like the triangle of the ultimate causality, cause and effect uh, study that we can have, there's only one published. There are many under underway, but one that was published by Kevin Hall and collaborators in the United States found did a randomized control trial and put two groups. One group was eating in a buffet style food that was mainly ultra processed. And another group was eating minimally processed or just processed foods for two weeks. Um, Over the the period of the two weeks, the ultra-processed food group consumed 500 calories more per day and gained about two kilograms of weight, alongside an array of other unhealthy outcomes. Then they crossed over the groups. So the one that was consuming ultra-processed was consuming then minimally processed, and the same effect happened. So I know this study has been also criticized because it was a small sample and hyperpalatability could have had the effect, driving the effect, and the fiber was put into the drinks, and an array of things. But till now, this is, I think, good enough proof of overconsumption of UPFs by whatever mechanism, and it has an effect in two weeks. Now, the displacement of minimally processed foods creates not only a reduction in vitamins and minerals and nutrients from its wholesome presentation, let's say. But there's also an environmental impact. Um, The level of processing requires a lot of energy from factories. And these foods usually come in plastic packaging. So there's an environmental impact from the plastic. But also, most of the ultra-processed foods have some shape or form or byproduct of three agricultural commodities, corn, soy, and wheat. Emulsifiers are usually soy emulsifiers as a byproduct of the soy. Corn has an array, but for example, starches. And um, wheat is mostly used as well in flowers and 
Wheat is fantastic, you know, pasta, cereals, flowers, but it just it's used to an extent that we're over consuming a very minimal amount of n- n- non-diverse foods, let's call it that. And that can also play a significant effect because we're lacking the diversity of nutrients from other foods with more colors, with more nutrients, with coming from different places. And we're gearing our food system to be based on these commodities. In terms of palm oil, uh, the deforestation of entire forests to get the palm oil, to refine it. How you find palm oil in, in nature is a bright orange color. Mostly nobody knows that. And when we strip out the color, <laughs> out of the palm oil and deodorize it and bleach it. It's basically an inert substance without the color that it originally had that could potentially have some protective nutritional effects. So it's it just food is just stripped out of most of the goodness. And we can talk about not all ultra processed food is bad and there are healthier options than others uh, for a couple of reasons. But overall, as a category, we're consuming too much of this. So if the proportion of our intake is two thirds, we can talk about anxiety, lack of sleep, some tumors, Crohn's disease, and it's just an age group that will live less years of health. That's kind of the theory that, that, that we're starting to see. And we cannot monitor that until it happens. But the trend seems to be that. Is there an eroding of food culture, would you say? I lived through it. As a Mexican in 1994, I lived through the North American uh, trade agreement with Canada and the US. And Mexico has a very rich agriculture, fruit, veg, traditional food, sitting on the table, sharing a meal with your family. And I saw this transition from being home-cooked food into a Walmart and packaged foods, which was also very aspirational because being so close to the US, it was, I wanna be like them, this Americanization of, I wanna be like them, I wanna be, you know. And from bringing fruit in the lunchbox, we started to bring Twix or Cadbury bars or Pop-Tarts. And don't get me wrong, they are delicious. And I do think that there is a space for ultra processed foods in our diets. Limited, less than we're having, but that transition, living through it, and also being a a sports person, because I was playing basketball quite intensely then, I had to get those calories from somewhere. And I did feel the difference between having food made from my grandma or my mom or having something in a package. And it was just experiential and it was just my own experience. But I did start to feel that there was something off. And I started to see my peers um, develop overweight very rapidly. It was observational, it potentially anecdotal. But then suddenly we saw the, the figures of overweight and obesity from the 90s to the early 2000s just rise like never before. So there, there is transition, and that's, I think that was the motive from Carlos Monteiro and, and team to try and understand what's happening. Why are we moving from the erosion of traditional diets, uh, feijão and uh, beans and rice and, and minimally processed food into these aspirational milkshakes with protein and a packaged food that you shut in the microwave? It saves time. That, that's the thing, it's very convenient. So they, for this fast paced life of, I don't have time, I have a, mi- a protein milkshake, chuck something in the oven, chuck something in, you know, in the microwave and, and you're done. So the, I do think there is an erosion of traditional diets, definitely. One of the things that has struck me was the comment you made about almost a lack of diversity in the foods that we're using. Is this a, a global north, global south kind of divide in terms of UPFs or is this infiltrating the whole globe? That's a great question. And worldwide, let's say developed economies on average are consuming between 50 and 70% of their calories from ultra processed food. 
developing countries are consuming between 15 and 30 percent of their calories. So developing countries, for example, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, India, and developed economies, Canada, UK, the US, they're consuming relatively the, the same amount. There is a divide. However, the growth in or the increasing consumption of UPFs in developed economies has, I hope, <laughs> peaked. And the increasing consumption is not being, the rate is not increasing. In developing economies, they are at 30% now, but it is increasing. So I wouldn't be surprised if that 30% becomes 40 and then 50 if we don't have interventions. We are living in a globalized economy. So all of these byproducts, all of these ingredients are being manufactured in developing economies like Mexico and transported to the globe to be used in the ultra processed food making. So there is a difference between developed and developing economies, but the risk is that developing economies we're still growing and we're still having to deal with a bunch of other issues like stunting, undernutrition and the coexistence of undernutrition and undernourishment, overweight, obesity, caries, that kind of thing. So it's not an equal balance there. Is it fair to say then that this research, whilst at its heart is about UPFs, ultra processed foods, but in a more holistic, general manner, is about systemic change. Absolutely. And that's why I like to talk about ultra processed food concept. Now, we need classifications to study things and put it, I'm afraid, into boxes. But the the wonderful thing about ultra processed food concept is that it highlights exactly that systemic change. Because more and more I see that agriculture has to deal with feeding the world. It doesn't matter what, but just produce calories. And public health has to deal with all the unintended consequences of an overconsumption of whatever many calories are produced. So it's not anybody's fault or it's everybody's fault. I think we need to look at the system as a whole and what are we producing what is happening in the long term, what's the physical environment, what's the digital environment, and can we use the digital environment for, for good as well? And there, there's some uh, research and, and movements trying to do that. The thing is the balance is still on the unhealthy cheap rather than, I mean, let's make Apple sexy again, please, you know? <laughs> like, can, can we please? And it's a bit laughable because in the morning I try to have porridge, just rolled oats and hard boiled eggs. And it's like, oh, that boring food. Or my mom would say, oh, you're bird food. It's not that boring. I actually enjoy it, but it takes a bit of that is what works for me. I know I can invest this amount, amount of and sometimes it takes planning. And not everybody has planning time, especially if you're working two shifts and have kids or caring for somebody else or it is a system. Ultra processed food concept as Nova, <laughs> supernova, let's look at systemic change. Let's look at where the globalized economy that we're living in through a more enlightened, a kinder, I think in a kinder light for everybody, not just the privileged of, and observe what we can do as a society to drive change. Thank you to Dr. Jana Ina Chavez Ugaldi. And to find out more about ultra processed foods and the Epidemiology Unit, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook.